Hello and welcome to Crucible of Words for more dedicated legacy action. Today I have a donation deck. Sony wanted me to play their interesting sort of cloud post big mana prison brew. So here we are. As you can imagine, the mana base is going to be a key part of looking at this deck. We've got some Urza stuff. We've got Urza's Tower. We've got Urza's Workshop. And we've even got Urza's Cave. So we're using Planar Nexus to really jump these up because this is going to be an Urza land. It's going to make sure that our tower taps for four. We've seen this in other cloud post decks before. It's going to mean that we have more Urza lands for the purposes of our workshop. So this should hopefully be tapping for two, three mana as the game goes on. And Cave. You don't see this one as often. It's a come to play untapped land. Taps for one mana and you can pay three, sack it and go and find another land from your deck and put it in tapped. So we can sort of use this to go and find like our Blast Zone or our Caracas. Or just to get some more mana of another variety. Or of course the Ivugan. Then we've got a uh, smattering of cloud posts. We've got four cloud posts, three glimmer posts, and obviously the plane nexus count for those as well. Because we're a colorless deck, we're not trying to use lots and lots of copies of these via things like sewing microspawn or crop rotating for them or whatever. So that's like the mana base, really. Lots of colorless mana. What are we going to be spending that on? Well, we've got vexing baubles here to try and make sure that all of our spells resolve through hard counter magic, like force of will and force of negation. So that's what these are doing for us. And then we want to go up into Disruptor Flutes, which is going to be on Wasteland quite often. We also have the Pithy Needle, which is kind of like a fifth Disruptor Flute here, is the way to think of it. So that's going to be on Wasteland a fair bit at a time. We've got a couple of Sphere of Resistance, trying to slow our opponents down a little bit. We've got the Ensnaring Bridge to make sure we don't get attacked. We've got Tangle Wire to suppress the game. So the idea is the Tangle Wire here comes in and it locks the game down for a few turns. But we get to make some land drops. And sometimes all you need is a few turns to make land drops and then you get to pop off and go wild with all your mana. So that's what these are trying to accomplish. And it, this is a symmetrical effect that's not very symmetrical because it taps itself and then taps a bunch of other things too. So this is usually pretty good. If we've got things like the Sphere of Resistance or Disruptor Flute or Vexing Ball, well, these sorts of things to tap them. We don't even have a downside to this one quite often. We have the Palantir, which is a thing that conscribes towards something good, as well as just giving us a bit of damage in on our opponent, so that our, our Emrakul is probably going to be lethal in one hit anyway. That's not really a big deal, because we're going to be hard classing this. But this is going to do some good work at smoothing out our draws. We have this card, Monument to Perfection. This is not one I've played with before. It's a two-mana artifact. You can pay three and tap it to search a library for a basic, sphere, or locust land card. Reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle. So this can go and get us our Cloud Post or our Planar Nexus. So that's kind of interesting to have. We can also find the Glimmer Post as well. And you can pay three mana and turn it into a 9-9 Phyrexian Construct Artifact Creature. It loses all abilities and gains Indestructible Toxic 9. Activate only if there are nine or more lands with different names among the basic sphere and locus lands you control. Now, this is a thing that we're not going to be able to do. So this is purely just for the first half of this card. So it's kind of like a slow card of Arch Engine that's going to pad out our mana a little bit. We'll see how this one plays out. It's not one I've played before. We then got ourselves some Khan the Great Creator. This is going to be one of our main sort of win condition engines. So we can go and find a bunch of stuff in Cyborg that we'll talk about in a minute. We've got a couple of Mystic Forge. So we can play a bunch of, you know, pretty much all the stuff in our deck. Now we're not going to be spamming loads and loads of opponents, but we have lots of mana. And this can help us a fair bit. And we have three copies of the One Ring because if you're playing Colorless Mana, this is the best Colorless card, basically. It is incredible and it's going to be drawing us all the things we need. Then we've got some other win conditions here. So we've got a Khan Liberated. Big fan of this one. Uh, takes me back to the old days a long time ago when I used to play Modern and this was the, the biggest thing people were playing in Modern at the time. And then you got uh, Ugin the Spirit Dragon. So this is going to be able to clear a bunch of stuff out that is going to be jamming us up. So if our opponent manages to sneak a few things through, we can then try and mop them up with an Ugin. We also have Ulamog and Emrakul that we can shoot for with our Ivugin. So that's basically the deck here. Because we are a Calm Wish board, we're not going to be boarding in a lot of our sideboards. So we've got ourselves... Three copies of Fairy Macabre here. Those are cards that are going to get boarded in. Chalice is another card that's going to get boarded in. And the other things are mostly just there to wish for. So we got a One Ring. We got an Argentum Master Core, which can blow some stuff up if we need to. The Lattice for the Lattice Lock. Another in Stone Bridge if we need to hide behind that. Some Graveyard Hate in this Solga Lantern. A couple more Spheres. These are ones we can board in as well when they're going to be useful against like Storm Combat stuff like that. Torp Raw, we can go find this to shut down Doomsday. We can also shut down some Death and Taxes stuff. We have an Oblivion Stone. I'm not wholly convinced by this one, but I'm willing to try it out and see. Uh, it's quite expensive for what it is, but if you've got lots of mana, then sure. And this can clean some bits and pieces up here and there. We've got a uh, Sky Sovereign. The reason we like Sky Sovereign here is because this gets to blow up things like the Collector Roof, whereas something like a Walking Blizzard doesn't get to do that. And yeah, that's pretty much the sideboard and the deck there. It's quite an unusual take on the Colorless Cloudpost deck. 
There's no denying we've got some powerful stuff. It's whether or not we can get to deploy our hand and get our stuff going. So I'm excited to see how this one pans out. I always like getting sort of weird and wacky donation decks that are a little bit outside of, uh, you know, your normal sort of tier one, tier two decks that I like to play on the channel as well. So it's nice to have a mixture, and I hope you enjoy it too. So like and subscribe. And if you want to become a YouTube member, it costs you one pound a month, and you get access to my videos early. So if that's something that interests you, why not do that as well? It helps support the channel, and it doesn't cost you very much. But anyway, plug over and done with. Let's make some big colorless spells happen. So our first opener with this deck. We have a tower. We have a workshop. We can make a turn two sphere that might shut down some of our own stuff. We can make a turn two disruptor flute. But we're going to need to find something a little more. However, this Urza's Workshop will start tapping for mana a few turns into the game. Do I think a turn 2 Disruptor Flute Sea Resistance is going to be necessarily quick enough? Unsure. But this is kind of what our deck does. So we're going to try and lean into it and keep a hand like this. I would like to find some more mana. I would rather have the Workshop Wastelanded. Because if our opponent does Wasteland this, we at least have the Plane of Nexus to draw. Which allows our tower to tap for 4. Up to 3 and then 4 with the Nexus. So we end up being quite far ahead on mana there. Whereas the workshop requires a little bit more work. We've got a polluted delta over there. An underground sea. What would you like to do with that opponent? A lotus petal. Okay, so we're doing something unfair. My guess is doomsday. And I think we're about to be shown a doomsday. Alright. My opponent could win this turn if they've got like a brainstorm or something. And they can just fire off this lotus petal and run away with things. Or like a Ponder and a Cycler. There's there's lots of options our opponent can have to potentially win the game this turn. But if we don't win the game this turn, it means the cards in the hand are quite likely to be things like Disruption. Our play for next turn is Disrupt the Flute on Thassa's Oracle. And hope that that's enough to stop our opponent. The fact that we even have a tool like Disrupt the Flute that can potentially stop our opponent from winning. Is a nice place to be compared to the sort of brown colourless decks of past. Some upgrades have happened. All right, we get to have a look at our opponent's deck here. Okay, so they're the, the four color build, which means they're splashing for the Teferi and the Veil of Summer. So we've also got Tamiyo in there, Temporal Mastery. That's a cool one. I haven't seen that before in one of these decks. What else are we looking at? A couple of forces. Uh, one, two. All right, they're just going now. There's three Force of Wills there, so they quite likely have one either in the pile or in their hand, which means we might struggle to beat that. I think our play here is disrupt the flute. Yeah, we're going to get the force here, and then our opponent's just going to win the game next turn. This is going to be a tricky one for us. Cycling a street race, they should be able to win pretty easily here. So this is going to fetch out one of the lands. They got one card left in their library. Blue, blue, blue. They can cycle an Age of Autumn. There we go, and then they just cast the Oracle, and that is the end of that one. So cards are useful in this matchup for us. I uh, would quite like this Sphere of Resistance. That seems like quite an important one to have access to here. Uh, the Chalice, also fine. Things we do not require here. Ensnaring Bridge is not doing very much for us. And I don't believe we're going to have enough time to leverage something like a Monument to Perfection here. The Torpor Orb is an interesting one. Do we want this in our deck so we can kind of spike it early on? Or are we hoping that we can slow the game down enough to then tutor for it? I think we probably have to leave as a tutor target. And we'll see how this fares. So what does our hand do? We have the Vexing Bauble. Our lands just tap for one mana here. But we do have some important pieces. So I'm going to keep this one. If the Vexing Bauble sticks, then it's going to be difficult for our opponent to protect anything they're doing. Now, Thoughtseize is definitely a thing our opponent's deck runs, which can strip away like our Disruptor Flute. And then we're going to rely on this Palantir to do some work for us. But so far... We haven't managed to make any of our lands tap for more than one. So let's play this Vexing Bauble. And pass it over. Oh yeah, sure. Another tower. We'll wait to see if our opponent casts a Dark Ritual. Then we can disrupt a Flute in response and mess up their Dark Ritual. No, uh, their Doomsday, sorry. So they waste a Dark Ritual. But there is a chance our opponent flips his Tamiyo. In which case we disrupt a Flute naming the backside of the Tamiyo. Might be tricky to deal with this Tamiyo. We'll see. We can get up to the 8 mana for Ugin, sure, but that's quite an ask. Flood Strand, another Ponder. So this is uh, Season Scholar, so we're going to do this in response. This will still flip, it just will be on two counters. Season Scholar. Because we, I don't think we can beat that clock of that just ticking up and drawing the whole deck. So we are quite shields down on the old Doomsday. But this is a mandatory one, so they have to flip this, so now they have a Planeswalker they can't activate. 
We correctly named the back side, not the front side. Important to make sure you do that. Planar Nexus, please. Not a Planar Nexus. So I think this turn we're just playing out the Saga here. True. If we play this, the sorry, play the tower out, because if we spike the right thing next turn, then it gets really good for us. We get the Nexus. So far, we haven't managed to do it. So ne we haven't managed to make these tap for anything more. But next turn, we can play the cave. We can go and fetch. And then the turn after, things get good for us. Um, mind the tangle wire here. This is going into the graveyard anyway. No, they let us keep it. Intriguing. They do have a clue token they can use. All right, so we have a doomsday over there. And we're just not really cooking with any amount of gas over here. So what do we need to draw to win this one? Drop to flute would help. A tangle wire might be able to buy us a little bit of time here. The Khan the Great Creator isn't going to be enough here if we draw one of those because we're not going to be able to get anything from it. We could draw a plane of Nexus, try and Khan Liberated and take out their lands and just keep hitting their blue sources. But that probably isn't good enough because they're already thinking about this tangle wire. Actually, no, they're not, they don't know about tangle wire, do they? So maybe Tangle Wire gets us through the day. I'm a little skeptical, but it's the thing we have to do. Oh, a Planar Nexus. That's something right there, isn't it? So this is three, six, nine, ten. So we can play Tangle Wire and Khan Liberated. I think that is better. All right, big old Khan Liberated. Exile one of their blue sources. Oh, they're scooping it up. Okay. We just need to top deck the player Nexus at the right time, I guess. Uh, I think we're just going to go back in again. Okay, so we have a little bit of fast mana. We can do Disrupt the Flute into Tangle Wire. Probably hasn't seen the Tangle Wire yet as well, so that might get them if they do a pass a turn line. But if they just bop us on turn one, then we lose. And that's just the nature of this matchup. All right, we're not getting bopped on turn one. It's a Ponder rather than Personal Tutor. So us getting hit on turn two is slightly less likely. Our opponent is spending quite a time resolving this Ponder. So, at least that means it's not an easy decision for them. Right, they did not shuffle off their ponder. Uncertain where that leaves us, but we're going to play a cloud post. So we play a glimmer post, we have three mana, so we can play a disruptive flute around a daze. A lion's eye diamond. That is a thing that allows our opponent to go off. Now, we could have played the chalice for zero. So the issue with doing that is playing it for one is so much better most of the time. But maybe since we're playing the disruptive flute anyway... The only thing it stops generally is like two Lotus Petals and a Lion's Eye Diamond. Sometimes you will see more Lotus Petals than two, but it's two to four as a general rule. Our opponent's got five in the pool, so we could see a Doomsday here. If they have any sort of cantrip to go alongside it, then we are very, very cooked. However, if they don't, we can jam this Disruptor Flute and disrupt their game plan. All right, here is the Doomsday. Right, our opponent spent a while thinking about their pile, and here we are. So, opponent's got one card in hand. If it's a cantrip, we are dead. So cantrip, in response, crack the LED. Knight Whisper. Well, we are very cold to this. So, they add three mana to their pool. They can draw into a consider here and just win the game. We can scoop that one up. We got some cloud posts. I like a cloud post. I'm going to keep this one. So lead off with a cloud post. So there is an argument to play a different land and get Vexing Bauble down, which can stop some decks that will turn one us. However, that does slow our roll against a lot of other matchups. All right, Prismatic Vista. So we were rewarded for not doing that. Excellent. And in Snaring Bridge, probably not going to be the best in a Prismatic Vista matchup, but we'll see. So we can play this Vexing Bauble around a days. Next turn, we can start jamming things like Mystic Forge and working our way through the deck. Generally speaking, Prismatic Vista is a sign of something like a blue-white based control deck. That's where you most commonly see this. But you do also see it in things like the blue-green Omni Show decks, which are basically just splashing for Veil of Summer and sometimes Eureka. And at present, we don't know which of those two it is, but if they were a combo deck, they'd be more likely to be cantripping here, and that's not what's happening. Do I think we're looking at some kind of hard cast days? Be a counter spell, a good old-fashioned counter spell. So we could try and get them with the wire, and then what would we tap next turn? One, two, three. We could try and get them with the wire and just keep them tapped out of stuff so that we can resolve our eye. Uh, sorry, our Mystic Forge. I think I like that plan. Get some life. So we could play out the Instain Bridge as another permanent to tap to our Tangle Wire, but we don't need to do that. We'll just tap these three, and then we'll still have three, six, 
sorry, four, eight, nine mana next turn. So we have loads of mana. All right, so this is just to try and tap our opponent out of their next turn so that we can resolve stuff through things like counter spell specifically or some kind of spell peer. Well, spell peer is probably not so much. This way our opponent just won't be able to interact with us on our next turn. Good old fashioned tangle wire. We're not going to be cracking this bauble because we're doing all this so we can actually resolve our spells. Okay, I am pretty sure our opponent's playing like a Jeskai control deck with back to basics in. So we want to put this on the stack at the bottom and then the fading happens first. We remove a counter from tangle wire and then we start tapping our permanents. So we only tap down three. You gotta love symmetrical designs that aren't quite symmetrical. Right, so we're gonna play out our nexus here. And then this means we have more mana from these. So we can tap one, cast a Mystic Forge. Anurza's Workshop, let's get rid of that one. We can only play spells, we can't play lands. A Caracas, it's not really the one either. So this is going to tap down all their permanents, then we can think about another wire next turn. I don't think we need the Instane Bridge here, we're probably going to want to attack with our own things. And we're not going to want to get caught underneath our own Instane Bridge, or have to use one of our Ulamog things to blow it up or whatever. So I think we're just passing it. So next turn, we can play the Eye of Ugin. We've got four Locuses. So this is eight, nine, ten mana. Tutor with for something with the Eye. And then follow it up with casting it the turn after. You can probably tutor and deploy a... Actually, can we tutor and deploy a Tangle Wire? Because we want to make sure our opponent's permanents are very much locked down. Right, no additional follow-up from our opponent. Giving them the old tangle wire treatment. We'll see what's on top with the Mystic Forge. And I don't want to draw this Caracas. I don't really want to draw this Caracas. Thinking about it. But let's uh, resolve our tangle wire first. Can't go crater. Now that is what I would describe as an absolute banger here. So how much mana do we say? It was 10, wasn't it? Which is exactly what we need, right? 8, 9, 10. Cast this Khan. We're going to get the Microsynth Lattice. And then our opponent is completely locked out of the game. Our Tangle Wire did exactly what it needed to do here. And we can play our Eye of Ugin. Why not? Then we can just animate our Mike Synth Lattice and attack our opponent. Our opponent has lands that don't tap for mana because they have no activated abilities. They can't cast anything for free because of Vexing Bauble. Do not believe our opponent has any way out of this one. The only decks that sometimes have a way out of it is using Spirit Guides and Visage. All right, so Tango Wire did the thing it needed to do there. So this does not strike me as a, an ensnaring bridge matchup. So we can think about those going out. What do I like here? I like some chalices to stop all their cantripping shenanigans. And I quite like just sphere resistance in general to mess with our opponent if they're trying to do lots of mana efficient stuff. So where is the cut going to come for this other sphere? It's probably one of these pithing needles. And that looks reasonable to me. We've got some big haymakers. We can try and stick them using our Vexing Bauble. I'm just very glad we got to Tangle Wire someone up good. So what does this hand do? It's pretty slow. It does have a sphere and a bunch of lands in a matchup where we do want to be using those sorts of effects. All right, I'm going to keep it. I need another artifact somewhere along the lines. But this is definitely a matchup where we can just play lands and then just do our thing. Because our opponent's probably got maybe two win conditions in their deck. Like adjacent the Mind Sculptor, Fourth Eolingus, some combination of those cards. That's probably all we're looking at. Our without anything to go with it. What is the correct play here? It's probably the workshop. So we just play both our workshops out and can get metal craft along the way, and that's all good. Trap to flute on back to basics is not a bad idea either. Part of the risk we run here is if we run out this sewer resistance, they counter it, untap, stand the back to basics. And we can be in a spot of bother. So now I want to play out this tower, I think, in case we spike the planar nexus. So we're going to pass and we're going to disrupt a flute in our opponent's turn. So if they play a back to basics this turn, that is pretty awkward for us. Are we supposed to play the flute now? They do play the back to basics. Kind of need to just play a bunch of lands out and, you know, get a spell that does something. So we can get the Argentum Master Core. Off of our Calm the Great Creator and eventually play that. I've just got a ponder from our opponent here. Right, let's try this Disruptor Flute. Consigned to memory. That's going to be incredibly good against us. Another Disruptor Flute. Right, they're cracking the Prismatic Vista so we don't name it. 
There is a possibility they have another consigned to memory here, though. There it is. Pretty savage. So we'll play this workshop out. If our opponent plays a back to basics here, we are in some amount of trouble. All right, we're brainstorming. They're still looking for it. All right. They did not slam it. Playing a Nexus. That is a handy one. So we've got four mana, five, six mana. So we don't get to play Khan and the Sphere. If we play the Sphere first. So that means we kind of have to play the Khan here. I'm not sure this is going to resolve, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. We could see a hard cast Force of Negation. A Mystic Sanctuary. Are they going to put a Consigned to Memory on top and then draw it? Yeah, we are very, very vulnerable to all these Consigned to Memory type stuff. Would you look at that? So we could have gone a bit slower here and tried the Sphere, but the amount of mana our opponent's got is meaning that the Sphere is not going to actually stop any of our opponent's counter magic. The Sphere is going to slow our opponent's cantripping for answers or whatever down or like hand tripping there towards their win conditions we're going to slow that down but it's not a case if we can play the sphere this turn the next turn we can get our Khan and it's definitely going to resolve so i think we're right to play the Khan now because if it does resolve it's lights out obviously it's not going to because we know they got a consigned to memory in hand now goodbye Khan. all right let's try this sphere of resistance right we're in now this backfires Tremendously if our opponent plays a back to basics. Lavinia. Okay, so this is can't cast non-creature spells with mana value greater than the number of lands. Okay, so that doesn't actually impact us, to be honest. Obviously, we have the Caracas as well. Khan the Great Creator. We do have four lands. Now oh, we need to pay an extra one, don't we, because of our own sphere resistance. Three, four, five, six. All right, we're just gonna play this Caracas out. We need a little bit more mana before we can do the Eye of Ugin, but we're not going to take damage from this Lavinia. A Ponder. Sure. They did not shuffle with the Ponder. Come in with the Lavinia. I think it's correct too. A Disruptor Flute. Not the most useful right now. If I'm... Three, four, five, six, seven. So we can go and get a big monster. And then untap and Caracas them away. So we can use this Disruptor Flute on something like a Jace if they play it. It's not going to stop a back to basics at this point. Okay, this is not a back to basics. This is a fourth Eolingus. A Ruination. Oh, lordy. Um, how do I feel about Ruination? Obviously, it's a disaster. But our opponent only has one card in hand, and it's Lavinia. Hmm. I think we're going to crack off this Ivugin. So at least if we can get back up, we're doing okay. But now the Sphere Resistance is destroying us. Now, this is going to be a slow matchup, so if we draw just like lands, we're going to be fine. I'll take a Vexing Bauble. No, I won't, because we have a Sewer Resistance, actually. Oh dear, oh dear. Carry on, opponent. Rumination is a bit of a scary one. And Urza's Workshop. It's a land. I'll take it. A Vexing Bauble. All right, we'll play one of them out. These can, in theory, charge up our Urza's Workshop. Really worth a Force of Negation to you. Fair enough. Also, the Vexing Bauble Sphere Resistance combo, not a great one. You're probably just trying to play the Bauble to, to draw a card with. A threat over there, opponent. All right, so that turns our Vexing Bauble back on and helps us out because we don't have to worry about the Sphere tax. So we're closer to casting a new Lamog than we were last time, even without drawing a land. That's something. Maybe this Tangle Wire will do something. We buy us a little bit of time. I'm skeptical. A Blast Zone. This stops our opponent from doing massive 4th Eolinguses. Do love a bit of Tangle Wire. Obviously they're just going to leave their threat available to keep pecking away at us. So we tap these two. Don't want to just draw a card with Vexing Ball, but I think I do. I'm just going to use my mana this way. Chalice the Void. All right, we're going to play this and then Jace the Mind Sculptor. And then we only have two permanents to tap here. See if we draw a land. Did not draw a land. All right, opponent, over to you. Our Urza's Workshop. Won't be able to tap for two just yet. We do need to have another Urza land, but we've almost meet, met the Melcraft part of it. So we're getting there. Might just be better off as something like an Ancient Tomb, but we'd have taken a bunch of life if it was an Ancient Tomb, so we'll see. That's something I've got my eye on for this league. A Flooded Strand. Harbinger of the Seas. Not actually as bad as you would think, considering most of our lands are already tapping for one anyway, but the actual scary part here is our opponent's doubled their clock. 
let's tap these two permanents. The remaining opponent taps six permanents. I just tap the lands and keep beating. So that's not really very helpful. Play Chalice. And pass, I guess. Our opponent's got a three tone clock here. Find a single point of damage from somewhere, which seems unlikely given the nature of their deck. But if they can, then they can jam us up a bit. Ooh, they tap the Harbinger. I guess it's still a three tone clock either way, right? So, makes sense. Tap Tangle Wire down, draw a card. We need to keep hitting mana here. I think we're just going to go to the next game. We don't need to keep doing this one. So, I like how we're set up, to be honest. It's just, we're not going to beat a Ruination a lot of the time. Kind of what the Spheres and the Disruptive Fruits are hoping to stop. Uh, we've got a lot of mana from the Tower Nexus. Our hand doesn't cast any spells. It's clearly an issue. I think we have to mulligan and try and find a hand that does something. Okay, I like casting the one ring. I'm going to keep this one. And um, we've probably just been off one of these workshops. And is a ponder. I think we're playing the Vexing Bauble over the over the monument. This feels very expensive to use. Play Vexing Bauble. See if our opponent wants to interact with this one. Hopefully they do, and then we play a second bauble and they'll feel real bad. And we're still going to play the second bauble, of course. That gets us towards Metalcraft. Not that we have other Urza lands yet. But we're working on it. Just blue blue over there for now. So it's going to be an honest to goodness counter spell. Certainly possible. It's just going to be a consigned to memory, isn't it? Yep. Better than a counter spell. I just don't think we can beat consigned to memory and ruination in a deck. And that's kind of a terrifying place to be. We're probably going to crack one of these baubles and draw a card in a minute. We'll wait for our opponent's end step because they might have a prismatic ending. I'll just stop them from wanting to blow it up. It's going to be uh, back to basics. Harbinger of the Seas. Oh, of the Tide. Yeah, of the Seas, sorry. I always get that confused. Harbinger of the Tides, Harbinger of the Seas. They're both Merfolk as well. Uh, I guess we're playing out the Mystic Forge. I don't hate seeing a land on top of our library, so we're going to draw that one. But yeah, our opponent's deck just has so many things that we can't really deal with. Right, there's a Ponder over there. They shuffled. Still digging with that Ruination. We can make Ruination more expensive with Disruptor Fruit, which is probably what we have to do here. Buys us a few more turns. Tangle Wire is not the worst either. Just off the top. This will stop a Ruination coming down. It's this Bauble. Got an Ezra's Cave. Do I want to draw a cave? It is a land drop. We do need to keep making land drops. I think I'm going to leave that on top. Maybe you're supposed to crack the bauble and draw that. We kind of need the baubles to be tapped. So we can play as many things as possible off the top of our library and dig. All, right, all the lands being tapped. They're just going to get us in for some damages. A reasonable way to play. So our Tangle Wire is popping off. I'm going to tap these down. Got a cave. A Sphere of Resistance. It does make other things more expensive. Like this Khan that's now on top. Play this. Let's stop Ruination. Like, we can't beat Ruination. Let's make it cost four more in turn. So we've got the Khan next turn. Six mana in play. So we can play the Khan with one mana floating and plus it. After that we can start working towards things like Ensnaring Bridge. We've got a little bit of time on our clock ahead of our opponents as well. Which might be a relevant factor moving on. Dex and Borbal, Sewer Resistance. Not the best combo I've ever seen. Because we make their spells cost one, so they don't get counted. Right, so we're drawing to this Khan. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So they can't cast the Ruination next turn. If we play this Disruptive Fruit off the top, uh, I think we're I think we're just going to exile it. Land. I don't hate the land here. I'll play the Khan out. Are we just trying to churn through our deck till we... To, so we constantly make land drops, and then we can play something big. This is going to be... Force of Negation, sure. So we've got a land ready for next turn. Otherwise, we going to take out two of their permanents. I have at no point wanted to cart his Monument to Perfection, to be honest. The fact that it only puts it in your hand feels like I should put it into play if you're paying that much mana. Brainstorm. Oh, we've got some pretty good cards that we can draw, potentially. Got to draw them, though. A Vexing Ball, but I don't really want this. We're going to play off the top, though. On to Rattle Through. Magical Line is struggling with this one. Take a Tangle Wire. Look for this monument. A Disruptor Flute. I don't hate the flute. This time around, do you want to crack this, this ball wall just so we can kind of continually go through our deck? Palantir. That can do some work for us. Right, so our opponent's got to tap 
five permanents. So Ruination is a little bit further off. Ruination currently costs eight. We're going to make it cost 11 with this next. Ooh, we'll even mana up. That suggests they want to counter spell something we got going on. So that's a consigned to memory, I reckon. Put these on like this and then do the fading. So fading is if you can't remove a counter from it, you sacrifice it. So this will still be around this turn. That will tap our things down. Another tangle wire. This costs three. One, two, three. Don't want this ruination to hit. And then, do you want another palantir? Sorry, another tangle wire? I think so. Let's just tangle them up. Because if all these tangle wires are doing enough, then we can stop our opponent from being able to counter this Khan, and maybe we get through with the tangle wires. What a weird game. A force of negation. Sure, that's a force of negation not pointed at our Khan next turn. I will take that. What a weird game. We've only got to put three permanents down now. If we're being precise, you should put the the tangle wire with no counters on. You should put that above and put its fading trigger on the bottom. But because the amount we have here, it doesn't matter. That's a thing you can do in situations where it matters. Because you can leave that permanent in and tap it and then sacrifice it after it's tapped. But that's not what we're about right now. It's quite like it's playing a nexus off the top. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, we're just in with it, are we? Okay. That is intriguing. Don't want to trade one of my creatures. All right, we're actually going to play this card now. And this is going to trade with their Harbinger if they attack with it. So I probably didn't have the counter for the Khan. So that way we can last them out. Maybe. Don't know why you wouldn't counter the Khan if you had a counter spell. All right, Tangle Wire has nearly run its course. So you can play this Nexus. And minus this. I would quite like to get this Sky Sovereign. And unlock all of our mana. Let's try that. One, two, three, four, five, six. Should have left up the workshops actually. And the tap for more. Consigned to memory. Who would have thought? Many replicate triggers there. And we haven't played a land yet, have we? Don't want to crack this ball. We have played a land actually, haven't we? Um, okay. Can't plus the Khan. Can't do anything really. All right, we're into the red clock now. So if they attack the Khan, our Khan doesn't get to find the thing it needs to find without dying. So we can't lattice lock our opponent. Narset, Parter of Veils, that's fine. What are you going to look for? Another Narset, wishing for more wishes. Sure. Yep, Khan eats some damage. Not unexpected. How much do I like Tangle Wire here? It is taxing our opponent's mana in a way that makes Ruination very difficult for our opponent to ever play. One, two, three, four. Play the Tangle Wire. And then we'll go one, two, three, four. We'll play the Palantir. And then we'll plus the Khan on this Tangle Wire that's going to die next turn anyway. Do I want to kill their Narset? Do I want to block? I think I want to block and pres preserve our Khan here. All right, so now our Palantir triggers. Uh, this can go on the bottom. This can go on the top. I imagine our opponent is going to... Yeah, they're going to take 15. <laughs> okay. I don't know if I want this Glimmer Post yet. Paying one life is a real cost when our opponent has got a 2-2 creature. Yep, Narset, what are you going to find? A Teferi. Teferi, pretty good. I don't have any white mana, though. There's a Narset. What are you going to find with this one? Another Narset. Okay. Right, we're going to take out this Glimmer Post. Chalice of the Void. Not exactly where I want to be. I'm down. Do I want this Chalice of the Void? I don't think I do. Okay, so we've got an Urza's Workshop. Doesn't really do the things we need to do. We could minus here. Our opponent can play. They can't play consigned to memory, but they could play a force of will here. And we can't really do much about it. I think. Can't lattice lock them. We could insane bridge them. Shields up. We can shuffle this land off the top using our scry here. Right, we'll go on the bottom. This can go on the top. Ah, they put the Ugin in and we got the kill with the sorry, they put the two four drops in there. The one ring and the Khan. Is this a bug? Hmm? Did they... I don't know. They're asking if it's a bug. Um, because they might must have... Uh, they chose no for Palantir. Oh, they just clicked the wrong thing. Uh, they meant to let us draw the card and hope that the Narset would, would fake it out, but I think they just clicked the wrong thing there. Alright, we got a match. It was a long one. Let's go to round three. Uh, okay, our opponent is well known for playing Death and Taxes. 
Does our hand beat death and taxes? No. Does our deck beat death and taxes? I don't think it does. So we could be in a spot of bother here. Uh, I think we need something that doesn't have a 15 drop in it. Okay, there's a lot of lands here. We have some hate. We don't really need this vexing bauble here. Have hate for wasteland. I think we're going to be having a bad time with all these like ghost quarter spirits and wastelands and all that jazz. Ether vial. Now we actually have cloud posts and some other posts, so that's not bad. The crackers can keep certain things out of play, but Thalia isn't really seeing play very much, even in death and taxes right now. All right, opponent, what would you like to do? That's a wasteland. Don't do it. They didn't do it. Stoneforge. That's also a problem. That's tough. So I think we have to play a Glimmer Post here and a Disruptor Flute. I think we still have to name Wasteland here. I don't think we're winning through Wasteland. We have to find a way to use our Khan to get through the Cauldra. And even though it says Valley of Gar Gargoroth or whatever it is, Gorgoroth, uh, it's still a Wasteland is the actual name. Personally, I think it would have been better if it was the other way around. So it said Wasteland on top and then Valley of Gorgoroth underneath it. Just from a design perspective, I don't think it's great to have cards with different names from their actual names on top of them. It's a bit like the the Wild West set where they had the special cards that all had like prosperity at the top for like the fake newspaper they had in the in the world. So every card just looks like it's a copy of Prosperity. I don't think that's a great design choice either. Anyway, rambling aside with, let's see how much we can deal with here. We're going to have a Glimmer Post. We're going to be able to gain a little bit more life. And then if we find another one, then it can give us enough life to survive even longer. But if our opponent has the, the little phantom that blows up one of our lands, then we just scoop, I think. I don't think we beat that. Cauldra complete. Yep, jammed right into our face. We can turn Cauldra into a 7-7 creature to make it fall off the germ, but that doesn't feel like a great thing for us to do either. So I think we're just playing this Glimmer Post, getting some more life. One, two, three, four, five. Let's go and get to Khan. Let's minus this. Hopefully this is also like a bit of a distraction as well. And we're going to get this Ensnaring Bridge. Do I want that? Is that better than Sky Sovereign blowing up? Like, what are we blowing up here? No, we just need to hide behind the bridge and hope that our opponent doesn't have Skyclave Apparition and blow us up. But they have four Skyclave, four Recruiter to find Skyclave. So I'm not convinced that's the best way forward. The other option we had here was to play the Caracas to bounce the Thalia and then play the... That still doesn't play the Khan, right? One, two, three. No, that doesn't play the Khan. All right. I was... I didn't want to do that anyway because I want to have more mana available for next turn so we can try and empty our hand. So this is probably going at the Khan. That one's going at the Khan, that one's going at the Khan. Okay, sure. So they're hitting us with five and killing our Khan. Not unexpected. Aethervile is now at three so they can start doing all sorts of scary things. Yikes. Uh, Snowing Bridge can help a little here. So I think we go Caracas, Bounce the Thalia, Play the Ensnaring Bridge. Play the Vexing Ball. But now only the Stoneforge can attack. And as soon as our opponent finds the right thing, she's just going to absolutely murder us with whatever she's got there. Recruiter of the Guard. That goes and gets the Skyclave Apparition here. They then play next turn. Blows up the Ensnaring Bridge. And then we are taking seven. And they're also going to have another body, so we'll be dead on the following turn. We do have Ensnaring Bridges in our main deck. But if they correctly... So what they can do here is she wants to put in the creature with the vile trigger on the stack. Then up a counter, then play a land, put Yorin into hand, and then next turn they can Yorion flicker their Skyclave. Okay, they got a Witch Enchanter. That's, uh, that's pretty good too. And then if they find a land, they can just Yorion us next turn. And there's no way we're beating that. This matchup does not feel like it's one that we're going to be winning. They've got the Stoneforge Mystic left untapped. That's a little scary for us. Another Thalia. That taxes us a little bit, but it's not the end of the world. One. So this is three, four, five, six, seven mana. So one mana gets rid of the Thalia. OK, 
Okay, we have to sacrifice his Vex and Bulb, I think. It's terrible in this matchup anyway. Tangle Eye, you say? That's not going to do it. Okay, let's go to the sideboard. I do not like how that one went. So these Vexing Baubles do not feel very good. What do we have that does feel good? I'm not a big fan of the Sphere either. So I think we're going to have some of these Cyborg stuff just in our main deck as things we can draw. Which ones is the question? I think having one in Stonebridge and the Cyborg to go find makes sense. The Torpor Orb is probably the main thing we're going to find though. If we're playing the card, we're going to want the Torpor Orb. So maybe we have the Stain Bridge in the main. And we can just go and get the Torpor Orb that way. Lattice we obviously want over there. Skyship is pretty good. Probably just want the One Ring in the main. Maybe an Oblivion Stone. Take the Master Core. What do I want? Yeah, I'll take the Master Core. And just have some beefcakes. I don't really like the Sphere of Resistance too much here either. But there's only so many things we can bring in. We've got a Cloud Post. And a Glimmer Post. Does it get better than this for us? We can live that Tangle Wild Life. So just jam the Palantir and just slowly grind away our opponent that way. I know which side of this matchup I would like to be on, I think. We're not a Cloud Post deck that accelerates, like the green one that has things like Sowing Micro Spawn that just completely gets out of hand. Cloud Post, go. Wasteland, waste us, go. Yep, that's going to be good. So we're just going to have to actually pay for our spells the fair way. We'll play this workshop. We'd rather play the Glimmer Post when we have more stuff to gain life with. And the Caracas, we might want to save. Because they won't deploy Athalia if they see the Caracas. It's going to be a Mother of Runes shot. So I think our next land drop is either the... It's probably not the Caracas. It's probably just the Urza's Cave here. So we'll see what our opponent deploys. If they drop something like a Stoneforge, then throw in the Disruptor Flute and stop it after they've gone and got their cauldron or whatever. I would describe this one as a disaster. Do I think we can realistically beat what our opponent's doing here? It feels pretty hard to beat right now. We don't have any basic lands. Getting set back. All right, we'll, we'll let them destroy one more land and then we'll scoop. Goodbye, Ezra's Cave. Mother Runes doesn't really impact us. I think we just name Stoneforge Mystic. That's the thing that ends the game the quickest. And we just want time. No, we will not use the ability. We have no basics. Now our opponent knows that. We're in trouble. Mother Runes being kept back to defend against things like... Dismember. Obviously we don't have that. I wouldn't mind having some Dismembers. It's not where we're at right now. Two of your finest damages. Another Wasteland. Yeah, okay, I'm going to scoop this one up. I don't think we're winning this one. Alright, so that's three rounds in the book. I did not expect we'd do very well in this matchup. And I think we can see why. Okay, let's go to round four. All right, this hand is not particularly exciting to me. Lots of these disruptor flutes, double panther. It's just not going to go for me. We need some more mana. Cloud post into workshop. I guess we can maybe work towards a monument to perfection and maybe that will pull us out a little bit. But I'm not convinced. We will keep. We'll bottom one of our disruptor flutes. Our opponent is... And a very good Painter Servant player. And they have a channel that you should definitely check out if you like Painter. They make pretty much the best Painter Servant content out there. Alright. Uh, there's this workshop. Alright, I'm going to hold up this Destructive Flute. There are things we want to hit with it that aren't Grindstone sometimes. So, like, if they put in a Goblin Engineer or a Goblin Welder, that might be something we want to target first. We can play the One Ring relatively soon. I'd love to draw a Glimmer Post. That would help out. Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Okay. It's not really where I want to be. So I think we're probably looking at just having to nay... We don't actually care about the, the Grindstone when we have Emrakul in our deck. So we're probably on this Disruptor Flute plan. And we're going to name the backside of Fable. This will tell our opponent that we don't have that we have Emrakul as well, I think. For reflection of Kiki Jiki. Flexing Bauble. Not the most exciting one. So if we play Tangle Wire, that means that we can't play the One Ring next turn if we draw the land. 
We play this Vexing Bauble. I want to crack this so that we can find a land. We've already played land this turn. If we crack this now, we might find another Vexing Bauble. That's reasonable. This means that their welders can do some stuff against us. So we found the Plane of Nexus, which is going to be big. It's going to give us a nice jump in mana. We can get our One Ring down to have a turn where our opponent doing anything too disruptive to us. And we just start drawing a bunch of cards. Needs to be a little concerned about Goblin Welder. If we find it here. But we're just going to take a beating. The favor of the Mirror Raid was so good for Painted Deck. It just gave them this wonderful mid-range gear that the deck kind of lacked a lot of the time. May have been too good for some other formats. I think people, I think it got banned from in standard or whatever, but perfect legacy card. Absolutely perfect. All right. Apparently has one white mana. I think that's just because they're going to play a colorless spell and it's the first thing you click when you sacrifice treasure. There's a grindstone. So they will have a soul guide lantern they can use at some point to exile our graveyard with the emerald trigger on the stack. All right. There is a goblin engineer. There's a painter servant. They've got an uh, like a wellspring, which is pretty cool. Okay, deck. We have more mana now. How much does tap for? Two mana. Three. Four. We'll play this one ring. Would love some protection. Let's draw a card. This does not have metal cross. It's only tapping for one, so we didn't get to make any follow up plays. So this engineer can bring back the painter servant and they can grind us. We will get to Emrakul cool our way through it, but if they find the Saga Lantern, then we are obviously cooked. And they can do this in our upkeep. So the one ring protection is just saving our life total here. They're still going to attack because they want all these treasure tokens so they can start sacking them to the engineer and doing some pretty exciting things over there. Okay, they've got an ensnaring bridge as well. They can also play sword and shield with the ensnaring bridge if they get multiple welder effects like that, for example. All right, the one ring is burning us for a little bit. We're getting grinded here. Or ground, I suppose. So they're going to flip this for a painter now. This is going to let them see everything in our deck. There you go. Magic Online is caught up and put the Emrakul trigger in the stack. And we get to carry on with our turn. Right. I would like to draw some cards. Our opponent has a lot of damages over there. And this and Snowing Bridge is probably not going to cut it in terms of the damage front. So we're playing out this Cloud Post. If we tap this and deploy a Needle... We can name Goblin Welder. That turns on our Urza's Workshop, which now taps for three mana. So we've got three mana here, six, seven mana. So I guess we're just going to try and play out as many things as we can. How much is two, four, six, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. This stuff ain't going to cut it, is what you're telling me. But if we put a Palantir in and we spike high, maybe that does it. Maybe we have an Emrakul on top. Let's draw a card. So now they just go 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11, 12. But yeah, they just have us dead here. I'm not going to insult my opponent's intelligence. They're very good at playing Magic the Gathering and they know what they're doing. So, Painter's Servant. I think some amount of Graveyard Hate is worthwhile here. And then, what do I not like here? And Stone Bridge is fine. The Tangle Wire is... Awkward. I don't really like Sphere of Resistance very much here. I probably has lots of additional mana. I don't really like the Vexing Baubles, actually. They're probably even worse than the Spheres. Okay, so we just have this. We can chuck in, like, a Master Core. Actually, we're just chucking in a One Ring. We're probably not going to be tuned for that. And then if we want some other bits and pieces, we can get rid of these and bring in... What are we choosing for with our Khan most of the time? Possibly an Ensnare Bridge. Probably a Lattice. Maybe a Sky Sovereign. So I guess that means we can play this Master Core in the main. The Torpor Orb is fine against some of their stuff. Like it shuts down Fury, it shuts down Engineer. Kind of it. Um, shuts down Friction Dragon Engine. Is that good enough? That's probably good enough to have it. I'm just not really a fan of these spheres. We do have to worry about Blood Moon. We don't have the best answer to that. Uh, this card, I'm not really sure I want to be doing that. We do have this, we have a lot of mana though, so we can pull more mana of our deck. But if we're just spending our turns pulling mana out of our deck with this, what do we actually accomplish? We do get to make a lot of land drops with this. We're going to we're gonna hold fast to the original vision of this deck where you get to play a bunch of lands and then those lands get to do a load of stuff because of 
the Tangle Wire buying extra turns. It worked against the slower controller deck. Our opponent's deck makes quite a lot of like random permanents. You know, the Fable can produce many permanents. There's a bunch of zeros in the deck. All that sort of jazz. Okay, we're going to lead off on the tower. Then we can play the Nexus next. So we've got four mana here. Do I want to just start jamming? I don't think I want to start jamming it yet. I think we're going to go... We're going to play this. We can't activate this. We can play a Pithy Needle. Uh, we're going to name Goblin Engineer. They would have had. A, they would have played a Welder if they had it. Now they still get to Tutor with the Engineer. It just doesn't do as much. Alright, the Saga. And a grindstone. So the saga can find the Soul Guide Lantern. A Palantir. So we could play this Palantir. That gives us Metal Craft. So we play this one out, attacks for two. We can then get our Tangle Wire down. I'm sorry, attacks for three because the player next is one, isn't it? Alright. Tap all your permanents, please, opponent. We also get to Palantir here. Uh, the Master Course is. Destroy a non land, non permanent creature. Uh, I don't actually think I want that right now. I'm going to put these both on the bottom. Disruptor flute in. I would have liked to have had that one. Will we activate a monument to perfection? If there's a game where we do, it's probably going to be this one. Kind of wish we named Urza Sag with this needle now. Wire, Palantir, Needle. The One Ring. Uh, I'm certainly a fan of casting this card. Let's jam this into play. Get some protection. Draw some cards. An Urza's Cave. We can play this and turn this into whatever we want here. This effectively taps for two because it works with the workshop anyway. So we play this out. Uh, right, Palantir. Find me the goods. On the bottom, put that on top. I would like to draw Khan. Khan, very good in this matchup. <laughs> Wowzers trousers. That is an ultimate Wowzers trousers moment right there. Uh, yeah, they flipped over Emrakul Khan. Oh, they'd already taken two from the Disruptor Flute. Uh, yeah, we 100 to 0 them with Palantir. What a time. Wowzers. Um, I think I brought out these monuments for some Vexing Baubles. Uh, these can stop some of their zero drops. Maybe that's helpful. I'm, I'm not like a big believer that that's actually going to be the most useful thing, but. These monuments have been not a thing I've wanted to do anything with. I think that last game we probably might have cracked it at end step to go and get a land. Or we could have gone and got... Um, we probably just go and get the tower, right? That's probably the best thing we could do there. So what does our hand actually accomplish here? We've got Cloud Post, Interplanar Nexus. We can play an early in Snow Bridge. We've got the Fairy Macabre to cover some of their graveyard -y stuff. And then we're kind of going to be drawing out from that point. I think this is keepable. If our opponent just has, you know, the nuts of good stuff, then we lose. And that's fine. They can just, like, curve, grindstone, painter, kill us. Our deck's going to struggle with that a lot of the time. We don't have good answers outside it. Well, we've got our needles and things. Uh, okay, I don't want to play a vexing ball. I don't think I do. I think I want to get our cloud post up and running so we can... Have the option of playing the Snowing Bridge or playing the Bauble and trying to draw some extra cards. We could see a Megs of the Moon here. There it is. Just going to have Exxon Bauble down. That'll stop any Lotus Petals, Chromoxes, that sort of jam. We're probably just going to cycle it though. Although we don't really want to cycle it just yet because we want to be getting cards out of our hand so we can be turtled up here. Painter's Servant. Yep, that's a pretty good Magic the Gathering card. To Pyroblast away anything they want as well. Just keep playing cards. Spherical card might not end up doing anything. But we can find a Khan that can blow up a Magus or a Painter. We've got the Master Core in the main deck. Speaking of. We're going to be discarding this Spherical card in an unorthodox fashion. Now, it's probably just going to get Pyroblasted. Truth be told. But we're going to play the things we've got. A Goblin Engineer. Okay. So we have the Spherical card. I was hoping to pitch that to a Master Core. I guess we might have to pitch... An Ulamog? Am I drawing a card with this now? I think so. We want something else to pitch the Master. Well, we've certainly got lands. Go Go Gadget Master Core. So if you're unfamiliar with this one, it's a 5-5 five, five first striker with protection from multicolored. So it can't be pyroblasted right now. Now it's in play. 
because of the the painter. And then at the beginning of upkeep, we sacrifice it unless we discard a card. When we discard a card, destroy target non-land, permanent, and opponent controls mana value less than or equal to the mana of the discarded card. So if we discard this to blow this up, how much mana do we actually have? So we have one, two, three mana from this. And then this is another three, so that's six. Seven, eight, nine, ten. So if we let them get the dragon engine, we throw this at the Magus, then we just play the Ulamog and take out their other permanents. Okay, the Mirror Breaker, sure. It's good. They're probably not attacking the old Master Core, at least. Let's shoot this Magus. Get out of here. The Khan. I do like the Khan, but that's not what we're about right now, is it? Now, if I've counted correctly, this should be good. Get rid of these two permanents. Do I want to get rid of the Fable? At this point, it probably is the Fable, isn't it? Now, attacking is a little bit difficult, but next turn we get to Khan and play the Lattice. A Mox Oval from our opponent there. Playing a land. So they can fire in the Frexion Dragon Engine. We block, then they get to unearth it and draw some more cards. That is a line that does do some stuff here. We need to not draw our Emrakul. That would be useful. Yep, so they're coming in to try and draw the extra cards. We're going to take that damage. So I'll throw away this workshop. Goodbye, Shaman Token. So we've already established we have all the mana in the world here. Let's cast this. And then we go and get the Lattice. Yeah, we managed to pull our way out of that one a bit more than I was expecting. Uh, our opponent did mulligan to five in the two games he won, which is a very, very much a real part of this, I think. We are doing some powerful things when we can get there, but we are kind of relying on drawing these at the right times. We're four rounds in, and we managed to put a two and two on the board. Let's see if we can get a positive or not on this one. We've got a hand here that doesn't make a great deal of mana. I think we need to try and keep a three lander on a seven, ideally, here. Although the Plane of Nexus is kind of the best land in our deck, because it turns everything else on. We're on the draw. Maybe we do keep this one. Because if we draw cloud posts or towers, this becomes great. And if I probably just turn ones us, then it doesn't matter. Okay, now we're looking at... This is a turn one affecting ball. Okay, that's not a Blood Moon. Manifold Key. All right, our opponent's going to be doing some amount of stuff over there. Let's jam the Nexus and pass. So we're looking at some sort of Khan Forge deck, which is probably going to be doing a load of busted stuff. Uh, the One Ring. Turn two, One Ring, why not? All right, I think our opponent's going to smoke us pretty hard here. Okay. Okay, they're going in for more cards with the One Ring. The more cards you go in for now, the more cards you have later. They're not going to be able to play anything else really here. So, what am I looking at? Disruptor, Flute, the One Ring. They put some counters on it. So we have some cards that are very good in this matchup. So the Disruptor Flute can shut down the One Ring. Great. We have Khan the Great Creator shuts down their entire deck. These are good. The problem is the speed at which we deploy them is far slower than our opponent's operating speed. They're definitely the better Urza Workshop deck because they have like lots of cheap artifacts. We didn't really have that. Going Flesh Raker, starting to get triggered, making some guys, making some damage to our face. We're just going to curve out and probably just lose to this Flesh Raker, which ignores the Snare and Bridge very easily. Yep, our opponent's playing a bunch of stuff. So they sacrifice their own baubles so they can play the Lotus Petal. Four mana. A Mystic Forge. Maybe they carry on going. Who knows? Every colourless spell they get off the top that they can cast gives them a spawn, which then lets them cast another spell. The Mystic Forge can cycle through their deck a bit. The issue is, if they give us a turn, we don't really do very much with it, and they get to Mystic Forge a bunch of times. Urza's Cave into an Estonian Bridge. This doesn't stop anything our opponent's doing. But it might protect our Khan down the line. Our opponent does have a clock on their face with this One Ring. It's going to be one a turn because the Inventor Fair is going to offset it slightly. Ooh, what's happened to the Ancient Tomb? No, maybe not. They can tap the Ancient Tomb and they'll be on one next turn as long as they stack their trigger from Inventor's Fair above the One Ring. Using this Mystic Forge is not free. Are we going to cheese this game with just the Disruptor Flute? We're on 12... We're on 10 effectively after they attack. Looks like we're getting an untap of the Mystic Forge here. So that's going to clear another card. So this one ring is going to put them to one. Okay, they're trying to kill us this turn. 
or reset the one ring. We might have snuck through here. I think our opponent was overly aggressive with what they were doing, but they didn't know what we're doing. So that's relatively understandable. Uh, sphere of resistance can help get things a little bit tricky for them. Chance of the Void can counter a bunch of keys and stuff. Uh, and Stonebridge, not at its best here. Uh, Monument to Perfection, not sure where necessarily that card's best actually is. Um, do you want another copy of the One Ring in the main? Probably. They were probably naming the One Ring most of the time. That does get a little sketchy. Um, I do kind of like the Master Core. I like this Master Core way too much. It's just because I'm a boomer and I see a... I'm, I'm a magic boomer. I love... I love just seeing Master Core, just like, oh yeah, that car was bananas. Well, the original Master Core. Um, maybe we'll keep in one of these monuments. Oh, they don't really use their graveyard. Oblivion Stone is something we maybe want to fetch for at some point. Uh, that doesn't have that many zeros. They have enough that it's worth playing the bauble. But what does this hand actually achieve? We can do better. We just want to try and get to Khan quickly. Okay, our own Mystic Forge, not the worst. We'll keep this. The Spirit Dragon is probably the weak link here. Our opponent is on the play. Okay, Voltaic Key. What am I doing here? So we could play the Cloud Post. And if we draw something useful, that jumps us up a little bit of mana. But only jumps us up to like Tangle Wire, which Tangle Wire doesn't look good here actually. Maybe that should have been a cut. We've got too many cuts for a matchup like this. If we play the Tower and we spike the the Nexus, then we get to go up to four mana and start doing our own Mystic Forging. Dueling Vexing Warbles. Uh, okay, so we're slightly punished for our for the line we took there. We do have a turn three Mystic Forge. That is ahead of the curve. There is an Urza Saga. Urza Saga Beatdown is something we are unlikely to get killed by, but it's something our opponent can pivot into. Uh, that combo is just so much more reliable and quicker than trying to make some Saga Constructs. Ulamog. That will be useful at some point. I hope so, at least. Who is the Mystic Forge deck now, opponent? It, it's probably still you. But uh, I don't really want his Tangle Wire. Get out of here. Our opponent's seen the Tangle Wire now. So we have things like Pit and Needle and stuff which can stop Sagas, but if they just get one Saga up and running, that can do a lot of work. They get two Sagas up and running. Basalt Monolith. Mana is certainly not the bottleneck for our opponent right now. Every manifold key is basically just a dark ritual. So our opponent's playing this into the vexing bauble on our side. That's okay. That clears it off the top of their library, so it's not a mistake. They're just trying to dig through their deck. Grim Monolith. Yep, that's a bar ritual. Manifold key. So a different line we could have taken in this game was turn one cloud post, turn two land, chance of the void for one. And that would have stopped a whole bunch of our opponent's permanents and would have put us in a better position here. Which is probably what I would have done, except I drew the cloud post, the, the glim post, which made me then want the cloud post in play. Right, our opponent has a 10 10. That's not small, is it? And that could probably be bigger than that next turn. The one ring, I would like to cast that, please. That buys us a turn. We don't really want this monument to perfection, so that can get out of here. There's his workshop, not really where I need to be here. I hate the cave. Um, if we crack this to draw a card, it's not actually helping us too much. That's one ring here. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Still not quite where we need to be. We do have another turn at least. We'd like to find another copy of the one ring to buy that turn that we need to get our Ulamog up and running. Because these constructs, they're, they're big. They are big. We need to find the Khan and get the Ensnaring Bridge down. These are probably digging with this bauble. We'll wait till our opponent's end step to do that. They have so much selection and card draw here because they just get to keep casting stuff off the top. And they're casting it because it shreds it off the top. They don't care that it gets countered. So they just get to make a bunch of mana here. Keep casting cards. Then they can just take the cards off the top using their Mystic Forges. And keep going. So we need to either play another copy of the One Ring next turn, or play a card and get an Ensnaring Bridge. Maybe one of the Ensnaring Bridges in and the Tangle Wires out. I think that makes a lot more sense. So at least we got some idea for game three. Kozilek's Command. They're just digging towards 
whatever they need. So Kozilek's Command and Mystic Forge is quite the combo. Because you just stack all the things that you can and want to cast on top of your library. And get rid of the other ones. And then just cycle through. I probably should be able to win the game this turn, I would imagine. Like, Paradox Engine is basically infinite mana. And into in pretty much infinite activations of your Mystic Forge. Put some on Lith. The One Ring. So now our opponent can draw a large portion of their deck this turn. This is why I don't think the Construct tokens matter that much. But if we can suppress what our opponent's doing them and put them into needing the Constructs to do stuff, then that would be a good place for us. Oh, there's a Paradox Engine. So there's the Paradox Engine. Do they have anything to untap? If they play any single spell here, I will scoop. It was a zero. Yeah. Okay. So, I don't know. Maybe I do like the Tangle Wire still. Okay, we're getting a Stone Bridge in at least over this Monument to Perfection. Because if we're trying to tax our opponent's resources early doors, um, we'll get rid of a couple of those and bring in a couple more bridges and leave one on this board. Try that. Like, the bridge wouldn't have made any difference there. It would have meant less clicks, but our opponent still wins the game. Okay, we've got a card post that does nothing into a workshop that does nothing. Okay, this works for me. We've got the tower into Nexus into workshop. That's a lot of mana. How much of their hand are they going to vomit into play? Quite a bit. Quite a bit there. Okay, they're untapping their Grim Monolith too. And there's a Vexing Global. They're probably just going to crack this and draw a card straight up. Another Vexing Global. There's the cracking of the Vexing Wobble. And they're casting another Vexing Wobble. Okay. So, playing a Nexus. I mean, getting this in is more important. Unfortunately, we don't get to cast the second one because the Sphere makes the second one cost more. Okay, we have an Stone Bridge to cover that. Now, they do have a lot of mana. They do cast a lot of spells at the same time. Mystic Forge. Is that what we want to be doing here? Getting our card advantage engine going? Or do we want to try and tax our opponent's mana base even further. Three, four, five, six mana. So we basically, we can cast just the sphere. That doesn't seem great, does it? We're kind of locked under our own sphere a fair bit here as well. I feel like we need to get towards some more lands as well. If we make the mana for key so they don't generate mana, that's actually pretty annoying for our opponent. All right, let's play a silly game here. We can still cast our spells. Let's hope that our taxing effects work. So this means that monoliths don't generate mana, keys don't generate mana. That's kind of a big deal for where our opponent's at here. So they might pivot into an Urza Saga plan, which we then have neatly covered with this ensnaring bridge. Another saga. Sure. Drawing a card. So they can still use the key to make mana off of the monolith they've got now. That works to add mana. They're kind of locked in with what they have. All right, so I feel this is going to be a big as a saga, smash face sort of game. Uh, yes, I will take this. It's a land. Three, four, five, six, seven. So we're once again locked into playing one spell because this costs five. But And then we can sit behind our Palantir potentially. But the problem with that is if our opponent makes us draw cards, we might be able to get the cards out of our hand. But if we're drawing one extra card and it's a land and we can play a spell every turn, that's probably fine. And maybe we just flip over an Emrakul and just dome our opponent for a bajillion. We can F6 our opponent's turn. Okay, they've gone away from the Urza Saga plan in terms of creatures. So they're just getting keys off of their sagas because the keys they get off the sagas do still generate mana. Quite a lot of it. So they've got 8 mana here. So they can cast a 6 drop plus another 3 mana into it. So they can cast a 9 drop. Paradox Engine. Okay, this will outdo everything we're doing here. If our opponent has a spell here, we do just lose the game. I am okay to concede that because this amount of mana is too much. GG's opponents. So we finished with a 2-3, which is kind of where I was expecting to finish with this. We got some powerful stuff, but there's some stuff in our deck that I don't think works that well. We managed to split some games as well, so it wasn't like we were just getting jammy here. But we did have to work for our wins a little bit, and we got a little bit fortunate against Painter where they multiply twice. But let's talk about the list. So there's some obvious things that you've probably picked up on as well that I'm not particularly impressed by, and that is the Monument to Perfection here. Uh, this is not a legacy playable card in my opinion. Two mana to play, three mana to activate, and it doesn't... If it put it into play, then I could see it. But the fact that it just puts it into your hand, that that's not good enough for, for me. Uh, I think one of the fundamental things I want to talk about with this deck, though, 
is the mana base and what we're doing with it. So we're kind of splitting the difference a little bit. So if you look at a cloud post deck these days, you'll see a bunch of cloud posts, a bunch of glimmer posts, um, maybe some Vesuva stuff going on, uh, some Thespian stage, which can also be cloud post type stuff, and obviously the four planar nexus. And then because of the four planar nexus, they run four towers because they've got space to run a colorless land. And this is going to be good with your planar nexus and gives you ways to like four mana on turn two. And because that deck runs a lot of tutors for lands, in terms of like so micro spawn type stuff, it means that it's a little bit easier to assemble, you know, the A plus B. So what we're doing here is we're a little bit slimmer on the actual cloud post stuff. We've gone further into like the Urza lands. But the issue I think we have here is that Urza's workshop isn't tapping for multiple mana that often, unless we're already kind of like, you know, sailing away. Because we need to get three permanents in play. And we're running things like Sphere, which makes that harder to do. So there's a little bit of anti-synergy there. Uh, so we're sort of trying to play these things out. But once we've sort of got them out, then we are relatively stable. And then we have more mana. So we have a bit more of a, a bridge from the mid to late game in terms of the workshop because once we're set up then this is going to be tapping for extra mana but then it might not always be tapping for extra mana but we do have a lot of stuff that goes with it but it kind of feels like we're splitting the cloud post and the urza plan and we should probably just focus on one or the other i, I could see playing an urza's workshop deck that actually runs the full power plant and mine alongside tower and the cave and urza's saga which is the best Urza land, pretty much. Uh, so we could run all the Urza lands and then play some cheaper artifacts to make these workshops absolutely sing and generate ridiculous amounts of mana. So that would be a deck that probably wants to have some sort of early plays towards the board, possibly even playing things like Mox Opals and stuff. We're trying to get Metalcraft anyway. We may as well have some Mox Opals and stuff like that. So that's another option you could do with it. Or you should just go more into like a more traditional cloud post mana base. So you've got these. We've maxed out on Glimmer posts. We could play some of the other posts that exist, whether that's for Suva or whatever, and that could get us there. I think splitting the difference isn't the best way to do it in terms of making big mana. As for the actual spells in the deck, though, I think there is a little bit of awkwardness sometimes with the spheres because the spheres speed us up. Uh, sorry, the, the spears slow us down while we're trying to speed ourselves up using, you know, as a tower type stuff. So it kind of runs a little bit contrary. And because we're not always activating our things for multiple mana, we had many games where these were all just single mana lands until like quite far into the game sometimes. And that felt kind of problematic because we're sphering ourselves and we're trying to get to playing all these four drops. And we don't have like our ancient tombs or reliable double soul land type stuff going on to get us into these four drops. So that's a little bit of tension in the deck that I think is somewhat awkward. The Tangle Wire worked more than I thought it was going to. So this did slow the game down against some of our opponents to allow us to play enough lands to sort of get going. We managed to shut down some people. And yeah, Tangle Wire was an overperformer in terms of where I thought it would lie. Uh, Mystic Forge, I think this has some awkwardness with some of the other stuff in our deck. So the Spheres and Tangle Wires with the Mystic Forge can be awkward. Now the Mystic Forge Tangle Wire isn't so bad because Tangle Wire is not really a symmetrical effect. We're going to be able to tap some of our permanents if we've got some Disruptor Flutes or whatever or Baubles. That's fine. So this isn't going to be tapping that many of our things. But the Sphere is going to make it harder for us to cast stuff off the top with the Mystic Forge. So we're maybe not going to go as deep. And if you want to be going into playing loads of Mystic Forge and doing lots of mana off of it, like our opponent was in the last round, like a Khan Forge deck, that is where Urza's Workshop shines. So if you want to lower your curve, maybe have a bunch of keys and monoliths and stuff like that, and then you can run a Mystic Forge deck off of like Urza mana, because then all your lands are going to come in untapped as well, I think that would be a better approach if you want to go into the Urza side of the deck. And that would look quite different, I think. And we wouldn't have as many prison -y things. We'd have a lot more mana stuff going on. But if you want to go more into Cloud Post, it means you want to be get doing bigger stuff. And your Cloud Post coming in tapped means that you're not going to be getting Metalcraft particularly early on because you're going to be having tap lands. So I think if you're going for the Cloud Post, you're looking to maybe accelerate out a three drop and then a four drop earlier, like a turn ahead. But your first turn, or t your first turn is going to be a tap land. Maybe your second turn is also going to be a tap land. 
So you need to have a way of going from not a lot of resources to more. And that's going to work for doing all your big mana stuff. And it might be fine to do with your sphere, because if you go turn one cloud post, turn two glimmer post sphere, that is a reasonable curve. And if you're playing more posts out, then you're going to, or more locuses, I should say, then you're going to end up being able to ignore your own sphere. But that's not always possible. And we've all, you know, played games with Trinisphere where you've got locked under our own Trinisphere and stuff like that. And Sphere Resistance can do a similar thing. I don't think our big mana is as reliable as it could be. If, uh, if these Monument to Perfections were things like Expedition Map, they would be better. I still don't think that's necessarily where we want to be, but that's another option you could look at here. I think if you want to be playing a Tangle Wire build that is more prisony, so this is kind of like a delaying tactic for us most of the time, but you could play a more prisony one where you're playing some aggressive threats, so you know, your low stone golems and stuff like that. I've played that on the channel before, and that felt quite strong. And that is a deck where you want to have things like Ancient Tomb. I think Ancient Tomb would also help if we're trying to be a Sphere of Resistance deck, because if you want to play a Sphere of Resistance, the best turn to play is on turn one. So you jam your Ancient Tomb and you play it. Not having Ancient Tomb here, I felt hurt us quite a bit, because we would have been able to have some lands up tap for two just on their own, instead of having to assemble, you know, our... Not quite Urzatron, but, you know, we having to find a Cloud Post and the Glimmer Post, or, you know, the, the Tower and the Nexus. Basically, when we had Nexus, though, it was fine. Nexus was the glue that held this deck together. If we don't have a Nexus in play, or our Nexus gets wastelanded, then I think we're going to struggle quite often. The top end, the fact that we can't tutor for the Khan Liberate and, and the Ugin makes me a little bit sad. Uh, I think I wouldn't mind seeing some more copies of these and just going more into the big mana style rather than trying to be a, like a full-on prison-y style deck. So we could get rid of these sorts of things here, add in some bigger mana stuff on the top end perhaps maybe we could find a way to smooth our mana base if we want to keep something like this but i think we either want to be going into urza lands or cloud post plus tower and depending on which route you take that depends on what the deck's going to look like and then you have to make a decision whether you want a prison -y style deck or you want to be like big mana or you want to be casting multiple spells off of a mystic forge there's several options you can go and i think they're all worth exploring in their own way is a case of what really appeals to you if you're trying to optimize this to make this as competitive as possible. Now, we all know Cloud Post is, like the green Cloud Post deck is one of the, you know, decks that you wouldn't be surprised to see winning a tournament legacy. It is, uh, you know, a tier one, tier two, two deck. And there are definitely people hating on it. There's plenty of stuff, as we saw, you know, Ruinations, Harbinger of the Seas. There's a bunch of stuff that's going to be in your way. And it's going to be a little bit harder for us here because we don't have any ramp. So they can always go and get their forest go and ramp out and get the with a micro spawn or they can go and get a planes and then source the plowshares the harbinger of the seas we don't have that sort of gear here and i think we are too heavily into our urza sub the, sorry our khan sideboard so we don't have anything like dismembers which might be really useful against those sorts of creatures so i think we could probably cut some of this stuff from the sideboard and have a smaller khan package because at the end of the day generally carning for a very small handful of things you know you're either getting your emergency bridge you're getting your removal for something you're getting your lattice to lock them out and that's all like you're getting graveyard hate to use immediately that's pretty much where you're at you can also you know getting a draw engine is fine too but i think a lot of these other things you know like um o stones torpor orbs stuff like that we, we could probably trim down a little bit and have some actual removal like dismembers going on or we could go a bit wilder and play things like All Is Dust. But that doesn't help you when your mana is under stress. So I'm not sure that's exactly where you want to be. There's also an argument for just having four rings in the main deck. It's just, just a very powerful card. And if you want to play more rings and you start playing, you could play uh, the Urza build with some Urza Sagas. That gets you some keys to start tapping your rings if you want to. You do end up looking a little bit more like the the Khan Forge decks, but I don't think you have to be a Khan Forge deck. I think you could be a big mana deck and just enjoy the the slight different mana base you've got going. But if you're an Urza's, an, uh, like a full Urza deck, then what that does give you is the ability to make some big Urza Saga tokens. It gives you the ability to have a tutor, which can find an expedition map, which can help you out, or it can find you know, your one-off Pithing Needle and stuff. And there's various things it can do to help you out on that front. And it also means all your lands are going to be coming in untapped, Unlike the Cloud Post deck, where some of your lands come in untapped, but the next turn, sorry, come in tapped, but then the next turn is just way better and more explosive. Uh, whereas the Urza ones, 
you can just keep playing them out. They're going to be untapped. So you're always going to be able to like curve out on your early turns, which allows you to play cheaper artifacts and more of them, like your keys or whatever. And then that also feeds into the Urza's Workshop having Metalcraft on. So that is another thing you can do here. I'm personally not a fan of having two Palantirs in a deck, but I also think it's reasonable to have two because you're going to scry them away once you've got one anyway. So it's not that likely that it's going to jam you up anyway. You know, you've got the Mystic Forge to screen it off the top in this list, as well as the Palantir itself to scry it away. One thing I have mentioned a few times is our inability to ramp, and there is a way of fixing that. You could play Golos. Uh, let's just pull that up for you lovely people. Golos Tireless Pilgrim. So it's a 5 mana 3-5. When it enters, you search your library for a land card, put it onto Battlefield Tap, then Shuffle. You can pay 2 and Wooburg to exile top 3 cards of your library, and you may play them this turn without paying their mana costs. So... This goes and gets you, there's a land that you basically pay five and tap it, and it gives you Wooburg. So that's what this gets. That's also an indestructible land as well. So you can use this to find that. And this could also give you access to some other removal. So playing a Nexus, that gives you effectively any color you want. So you could play some Source of Plowshares in the sideboard. If you've got some Golos, you can kind of do something a bit similar to what the the green cloud post decks are doing, but you could just splash white instead of playing green and white and just have your Golos as your like thing to bridge from the mid to the late game and also just get you where you need to be. Find that missing piece of like your planar nexus where if you don't have it, it can be a bit awkward. You can also find you some like nice silver bullets going down the line. You can set up like a Caracas Golos loop to just keep putting lands out of the deck if you're in a really grindy game. And I, th I think that would be where I'd want to be taking a deck like this if I want to be doing big mana. But I don't think we can... I think if you want to optimize either the Urza's or the Cloud Post, you're probably not smashing them both together in the same list. I would quite like to play a, an actual Urza Tron deck at some point and see how it feels now that we've got more Urza stuff. Like, the, the Nexus on its own means that you get to turn on all of your Urza lands. As well as, sometimes you will just draw them, and that's fine. You know, we've all played Tron once upon a time in other formats many years ago, and... You know, sometimes you just draw all the things and it's fine. And that could be an interesting big mana deck to play. But Cloud Post is kind of a known thing. There are people playing some colorless Cloud Post decks. They don't look exactly like this, but, you know, they've got your Khans and your One Rings. You've got your big Eldrazi stuff. And then they run, you know, Golos and a few other bits and pieces here and there. So, you know, we're doing some viable stuff here. But I think step one has to be to get rid of this Monument Perfection. And I'm not a big fan of the Sphere. Especially two is a weird number. And especially since we don't have any way of ramping out turn one, I think you, if you want to be going into like actual prisony stuff, I think you need to go quite hard into it. Whereas Tangle Wire is just a delaying card while we make land drops. And I think that is actually reasonable and performed better than I was expecting it to. So I don't actually mind the Tangle Wire here. Helps you resolve some spells, helps you keep your opponent down. Now, there are going to be situations where your opponent goes one drop, two drop, and then you drop the Tangle Wire. And then by the time your Tangle Wire is finished, you're dead. And maybe you didn't play enough stuff because your lands are coming in tapped or whatever. And that's just going to be a horrible feeling for you. Or, you know, your opponent starts wastelanding you as well. And all of a sudden your Tangle Wire is just making sure that you're taking a bunch of damage. Because if your opponent's ahead and can pressure your life to it when a Tangle Wire comes down and you don't have enough stuff to tap with it, then all of a sudden you've played a card that's going to be your own demise. Now, we didn't play against like Delvery Tempo style stuff. So we managed to dodge that a little bit. But that was definitely a concern I had when I looked at this deck to begin with. I don't think I have much more to say about this. I've been waffling for a fair while here. But there's definitely some trimming of the sideboard. I think people go a little bit too heavy with Khan sideboards. They go, okay, I've got a Khan. I want to have a tool for every job. And that's just not how I find myself playing Khan. I want to have a few specific tools. Now, we're playing Soul Lantern instead of Tormod Script. And I think that is understandable because we're going to have some Vex and Vorbles in our deck. But the Tormod's Crypt is a thing where you can play Khan on four. And as you've seen, we do get to four mana specifically. It's not like the way our lands are configured means we jump from three to five. So being having a Tormod's Crypt so you can play your creature, get your graveyard height and use it immediately is really key. And we don't quite have that. So even though there is a little bit of uh, anti-synergy with Vexing Bauble and a Tormod's Crypt, I would still like to see a Tormod's Crypt, I think. But yeah, so you want your graveyard hate piece, you want a piece of removal, you want your lattice. And you probably want a bridge. Those are the four things that you definitely need. And maybe you want to stick one other thing in there. And then from that point on, I would just like to have a cyborg that I can actually dip into and do stuff. You know, get some removal in there. 
would be a nice upgrade as well. Allow us to defeat some of these Megas of the Moon style creatures. But yeah, it's, it's a good time to be a big mana deck. There's multiple options you can do for a big mana deck. How many colours you want to play. What your actual choice for big mana lands is. You know, you've got people that are playing just a bunch of soul lands. You've got people that are going fully into cloud post. I think there might be uh, an Urzatron deck available. You're going to have to have more ways of tutoring for land if you want to do that. But if you're playing an Urzatron deck, you've also got Saga, which helps you with tutoring anyway. So that's a thing to consider. And most importantly, Tangle Wire is a great Magic the Gathering card that is really fun. Uh, not, not everyone's cup of tea, but I had a great time playing Tangle Wire today. And I hope you had a great time watching me play it. So thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe. It does help the channel out. If you would like a donation deck like this on my channel, by all means get in touch via the Discord. Or just leave a comment and we can sort it out. And once again, thank you so much for watching. Goodbye. If you'd like to support me in the channel, please check out my Patreon. It has a free guide to budget turbo depths as well as three tiers of support. A low cost one that enters you into my monthly raffle for a free donation deck on the channel. A mid tier subscription that gives you access to my detailed turbo depths guide that is updated every month as well as regular articles. And lastly, the higher tier gives you all of the above as well as a monthly donation deck for my channel. If you're interested in supporting the channel this way, please check out the link in the description.